So we're going to run through what I semi-laughingly call big-ish data. You hear a lot about big data and the fact that it's you know terabytes and petabytes of this, that, and the other, and exabytes and zettabytes. And yeah, that's big data. Ours isn't quite that big. We've got petabytes of asset data um, from a relational store point of view. It's, it's in the tens to hundreds of gigabytes. So it's big enough that moving it around is a bit of a pain in the backside. But it's not quite big enough that we're in the kind of NASDAQ and Amazon size of data. Talk a little bit about cloud and a little bit about what we're doing with machine learning. Um, obviously, we've got a relatively tight time frame, so I'm going to skip through some of this fairly quickly. Um, the intention is that this is about 20 minutes of me standing up and talking and then a bit of an open question session and you can kind of grill me and, and barrack and heckle. Um, uh, and that's, that's basically the gist of it. So, yes, we were introduced. This, incidentally, is a guinea pig playing Xbox, which I thought was nice, incredible, and impossible. Um, it was much better than what I got when I Googled people doing impossible things on images search. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we were introduced by Microsoft um, as this. We are relatively small. Um, so, we, as some branding, we are about 500 people or thereabouts dotted around the world. Um, our turnover is in the tens rather than hundreds of millions. Um, but actually, we're about the largest consumer. In fact, we are the largest consumer of Azure uh, compute and other services by range. Not by size, Accenture spend a lot more than us. The NHS spend an enormous amount of money on various computing services and so on. But there's nobody else in Europe doing quite as much with Azure as we are, even if some people are doing more of bits of it. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, this is me, um, which actually would have been funnier had they not just hired James. It was basically like my younger, more ginger brother. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm the CIO at Sun Branding. I've been there now for about three years. Um, the, the role I've got encompasses running our development teams, our support teams, our infrastructure teams, but I'm also responsible for innovation at a board level um, and taking things to our customers and saying, we're doing this and it's cool and you can benefit from it and potentially there's some revenue or cost savings associated with it, but it's fundamentally pretty cool. Um, I historically have worked in a couple of different verticals from energy and finance and a few other bits and pieces and FMCG and really when you look at my CV it looks like I probably was a contractor actually. I just turned out to be fairly unemployable for long periods. Um, so I've, I've been around a bit and I've seen various places doing different stuff um, in the role that I'm in right now. It's probably the best one I've had in, uh, in the sense the breadth of stuff that I get to be involved in. Again I'm going through this fairly quickly at the start because frankly who I am is fairly boring. Um, Bores me, I have to do it. Um, so this is some branding. We brand ourselves as individual specialists and collective experts. And these five pentagons represent our six different brands. Um, that was put together by marketing, which is why the number doesn't quite tally up. Um, we have our creative teams, um, and they draw pretty pictures and use crayons and make things look nice. Um, we have a pack science division, and they do the much more physical packaging development stuff. So we've worked with, for example, Liverpool Football Club, um, to redesign their entire own branded range. We've done some work with supermarkets to produce microwavable pasta things so you can take fresh pasta in a microwavable pouch, take it to work and microwave it. And when you come to eat it, it's a bit like eating fresh pasta rather than just mush. Um, I'm going to skip over the orange one for a second. We have a legal team and they do all the compliance based stuff around product launch. Uh, so when you say this is our new low-fat, extra-fresh pork pie, and in fact, it's 75% fat and has been in a packet on a shelf for two years. Um, it's our legal team that say, you probably can't say that on the packet. Maybe put it at the back in small letters. And then we have a graphics team who work with basically all of the other divisions and with the customer to make sure that when you print something, it comes out looking right. So when you print a red onto a piece of shiny plastic and you print the same red onto a piece of cardboard, it fundamentally looks very different colours and if you stick them on a shelf together, they look rubbish. So there's a lot of colour management stuff that goes into making things work. Um, I said I'd come back to the orange one. That's our digital unit, which again sort of sits underneath me. We sell software to manage the product launch process. So our customers are people like Asda, Walmart, uh, Rickett Benkiza, Glaxo, SmithKline, Coca-Cola. Big customers doing lots of product launch stuff. And their typical product launch cycles can be anywhere from about 40 weeks to about three years. Um, medicines and vitamins, long, long, long approval cycles, food's a bit quicker. Uh, we sell software that's designed to make that quicker, which saves you money and enables <coughs> you to launch more product in the same amount of time, which in turn means you can afford to launch smaller batches, which means the impact of a product failing isn't quite so big. And there's a few other bits around that that I'll come back to later. 
Collectively, the big red pentagon thing with the hole in the middle, we don't really have a name for our logo, it's just a big red pentagon thing with a hole in the middle, is the SBS logo. And that's really us as a family. We are based in Bradford, we have a small office in Leeds, we have offices in Addiston and in London and in Dublin and Rotterdam and a few other places. Um, we've got a few hundred people in Chennai and a few hundred people in Bangalore and a few hundred people in the States. So all in all, not quite a few hundred people in the States, but we've got about 550-ish people on payroll. So we're not, we're not that big, but we are quite agile and we do some fairly cool stuff. We are part of a company called Sun Chemical. Sun Chemical are very big, um, up in the ten, <coughs> tens of billions a year, kind of very big. Um, and we're dotted around here as Sun Branding. Sun Chemical themselves have about 1,500 locations. We're ISO 27001, 9001, Microsoft Gold Partner, all the stuff you'd expect of somebody that sells software, but it's kind of part of our offering. You've probably never heard of us, but our clients, most of you will recognize at least one of the clients. About 80% of what goes through your shopping trolley, we will have touched at some point through one of our brands, regardless of where you shop and what brands you buy. So we're, we're fairly well involved in the UK kind of retail space and the global retail space, but predominantly a UK market. Um, so those are some of the people that we service. This is a real product on a real shelf. Um, apologies to those of you who are in the audience that are quite sensitive. This is going to get worse <laughs> rather than better. Um, this was an actual buttermilk carton that Tesco launched. They put it on shelf. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, what you can't really see from the folded version is that actually this is a big orange background which goes round the side of that carton and it actually wraps around the back as well. This is a milk jug and it's pouring milk. The crease has been added by the helpful person who took this photo and sent it into the newspaper. Um, we deal with a lot of assets. We deal with a lot of pictures. We deal with a lot of things. And as it says in the bottom corner, you can't quite make it out because of the color balance, but yes, really. Um, this was not one of ours, although there are a couple later that were. As a 2D piece of artwork, this did not look in any way, shape, or form unusual. It was a big orange packet with a white milk jug in the middle. And it was very obviously a milk jug until you fold it and stick it on a shelf. Um, we deal with... <laughs> We deal with lots of pictures, um, and I mentioned earlier that we've got about a petabyte or so, about 1.4 petabytes at the, at the last count, um, of asset data. So we will hold, for these various assets, we'll hold the Tesco logo, we'll hold the little flashes that they put on for the National Dairy Council. If it's a product with photography, we'll have high-res photography and so on. And all of those assets are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It used to be the case that you would take a photo, you would go for a product photography shoot, and the photos that we would get to put on pack were a couple of meg. Those photos are now a couple of gig. So we've seen kind of a thousand fold increase in the size of an asset for the same amount of, same amount of revenue, same amount of work for us. So as our business has increased in terms of volume, we've also seen uh, not quite exponential, but pretty damn close growth in the size of assets that we're having to deal with and the size of assets that we're having to pass around and send to printers and then in this particular case, recall. Um, this is our data growth since December 13 in terabytes per week. So back in December 13, we were seeing data growth in terabytes per week, which was about 0.06 or something. Uh, June 14, it was up to about 0.12, 0.25 or thereabouts by the end of 2014. Middle of last year, we were up to about half a terabyte per week. End of last year, we were up to a terabyte per week. And at the moment, we're tracking at just under two terabytes per week. Based on the size of the asset growth that we're seeing, we are fully expecting, sorry, did I just shine that in your eyes? We are fully expecting, you should never do that, children. Um, we're fully expecting that by the end of this year, we'll be up to around four terabytes per week and that that growth will continue fairly exponentially. And the really challenging bit from a CIOE infrastructure owner point of view is that this growth does not correspond to an increase in revenue. We have all the costs associated with storing all of this data, but this assumes flat business from our point of view. No extra money, no extra charges to our customers, no extra volume in work. So it's just extra cost on our point of view. And we talk a lot as devs and as IT people and infrastructure people and IT managers and CIOs and so on about data. And it's actually quite hard to picture kind of what a terabyte is. So I found this analogy. I've no idea whether it's right or not, but it's quite good. Um, I actually do have a reasonable idea that it's right. Otherwise, I wouldn't be standing up here presenting it. But if a data, if a grain of rice represents about one byte, then a kilobyte would take about a cup full of rice. Eight bags of rice will be about a megabyte. So, you know, you think about this, this is suddenly quite a lot of rice. Certainly more than you want in one sitting. 
A gigabyte would fill three shipping containers, which is, again, when you think about that in terms of the size of a grain of rice, you get an awful lot of rice into three shipping containers. A gig is a lot of data, actually, when you kind of scale that up. But the growth rate is massive. A terabyte is roughly two container ships. So you're looking at an enormous quantity of growth. Having the ability to store a container, three containers, 10 containers as a storage firm is not unusual. Having the ability to store two container ships is very unusual. Growing at eight container ships a week is an enormous amount of storage. And if this were physical asset storage, it would be a real challenge for us. A petabyte would cover Manhattan. I really put that one in there just because I like the picture. Um, and an exabyte would cover the entire of the UK. Yes, that's us. Um, doesn't it make you proud? Um, it's, you know, it's a lot of data. So when we talk about growth at kind of four terabytes a week, five terabytes a week, um, by the time we get to the end of 2017, we're expecting growth in almost the hundreds of terabytes a week, which is actually quite frightening because even the stuff that we've put in, which is now petabyte scale, isn't going to last very long at that scale. So we're reliant upon our storage providers and partners to, to develop their platforms with us. Uh, this picture represents our creative team looking at their crayons. Um, if any of you know any of our creative team, please don't tell them anything I say tonight. So we've put in a, a cloud hybrid store. We looked pretty closely at on-site SAM, the traditional stuff that if you've got IT departments in-house and if you've got on-premises infrastructure that is going to be bread and butter to you. The biggest challenge we had with that is predicting the data volume that we'd need. To go out and buy a SAN right now that will store a petabyte's worth of data is pretty expensive. You know, it's a fairly large capex. You're sticking that into a cupboard in the corner. You've got a fairly long lead time. There's probably some pro services involved in that. And by the time you've finished, you've spent quite a lot of money. By the time we'd finished putting it in and spending that money, there's a pretty good chance that our expectations of data growth would suggest that it's already irrelevant and that we'd need to be replacing it again. And our capex cycle would shorten down to six months and three month timescales. And that's just not viable. So everyone says cloud, right? Cloud's great. You can put all the data you like in the cloud. And that's true, but the problem with the cloud is it's not in your building, and all the people who need to access the data are mostly in the building. Going back to that Tesco buttermilk carton, the assets that went on that buttermilk carton, bearing in mind it was an illustration rather than a photo, so it's a low-res image. It's a fairly simple piece of packaging. It's not very big, so you know, physically print size. You're not talking about printing large format stuff, shelf-ready packaging, big boxes, banners the size of a wall big high-res images. The imagery for that Tesco buttermilk carton was about 22 gig in total. I've got about 200 people sit in a building in Bradford and they double click a file on a drive and they expect that file to open. When that file is 22 gig, it takes a while even over a LAN. You put all of that data up in the cloud and you get people double clicking 22 gig files each and there's 200 of them doing it at roughly the same time and people in the room who are better at math than me can tell you how many gig that works out at, but it's basically too many. Nobody is going to wait while Illustrator opens up 22 gig if it takes an hour. And from a productive point of view, that's an issue for us because clients expect their products to be cheaper. So just like most of you in the room, we're expected to deliver more for the same amount of money or the same value for less amount of money or usually more for less money. So we looked at a couple of different solutions. Um, the one that we ended up with, and this is going to sound a little bit Microsoft-y sales pitchy by the end, but it's primarily because actually Microsoft have really helped us overcome some challenges. And in the, in the full disclosure, I think it's fair to say that Microsoft perhaps did that in order to give us some of their challenges too and let us feel some of that pain for them before they went completely production. Um, we've put a cloud hybrid store in which Microsoft sell under the Store Simple brand. It actually started out as an open source project. Um, Microsoft bought it. The original version is still open sourced. Um, but they bought it and they hired the team and they've developed it. What we've basically ended up with is an 80 terabyte auto tiering cache on-prem in Bradford, another 15 terabytes in London with a backing store of 1.4 petabytes. And it auto tiers between SSD and SATA, just like your on-premises SANs do in a traditional world. But it also tiers off to the cloud and tiers down to the cloud so that we can predictively work out what files are likely to be used and make sure that they're on the box. It dedupes and compresses, which even with the kinds of assets that we're doing, which are photography intensive, we still get around a one to two reduction. So actually that 1.4 petabytes is really storing 2.8 petabytes of underlying data without dedupe and compress. Um, the cool thing about this, again, is we're not very big. We're not that huge a company. You know, we're not an Accenture or Deloitte or anybody <coughs> out there that's doing kind of consultancy on leading cutting edge technology. But this was the second petabyte class hybrid cloud storage ever implemented in the world when we put it live. And it was the first in Europe. Um, 
The first one in the world was actually Google, not Microsoft. Um, but you know, we were second to the table, which for a company our size is pretty cool. From a finance point of view, it's made a big shift from us in terms of capexing over an uncertain life cycle. A lot of that cost has gone to OPEX. So for those of you that run budgets, it means I can predict based on the volume of money coming in, how much money's going out, and I don't have to try and depreciate it. But it also means I don't have to sit and have the really uncomfortable arguments with our finance director or CFO that I've just capexed a million quid's worth of stuff and I want to write it off already and it's only been in a year, which upsets them. Um, <laughs> Quite a lot, and they take it really personally. Um, so that's kind of storage. Again, I'm going to go through some of this fairly quickly. I'm hoping that it sparks questions rather than just an awkward silence at the end of it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about compute to go alongside the storage. And it, as it says at the bottom, if I've taken more than five minutes to get here, you're all staying late. Um, no sandwiches until I finish. This is basically the server infrastructure that we ran before our cloud migration. Um, it's slightly exaggerated, but it's not that exaggerated. And again, those of you that have got any kind of infrastructure involvement in the audience, and I apologize for not knowing where everybody sits in terms of roles. Um, those of you that have got IT involvement and those of you who are devs working on the crappy old kit that the people who've got IT involvement give you and tell you to run your production services on will be fairly familiar with the traditional cycle of renewal for CapEx to kit. You go out, you buy kit, you put it into a colo center or you put it onto an on-prem data center. And then you outgrow it because your customers come to you with bigger needs and bigger requirements and bigger data storage volumes and bigger compute challenges. And they want to do all the same stuff that they were doing before, but with more data. And they want to pay you less for it because everyone's out there selling 99p websites. And if I can get a fast host site for 99p, why can't I have my enterprise platform running for 99p? We were spending about 150 grand every year or so just on compute. So no disk, no storage, no nothing, no hosting, no colo in that. It's just about 150 grand on physical compute resource. Um, that was increasingly not buying a great deal. And it's great that Moore's Law exists and that computing goes up and that the available power of everything you can get goes up and up and up and up and up and the cost drops and drops and drops and drops and drops. I don't think server manufacturers are aware of this law because what you tend to find when you spend 150 grand is that you'll get kit which will run your business perfectly well and then three years later, 150 grand won't really run your business perfectly well and now suddenly it's like 180. You think, well, what has happened here? And three years later, it's suddenly 240. And you think, this is bizarre. I don't understand why everything's going up. So we were struggling to predict in advance how much money to, to spend. That, in turn, gave us some fairly big challenges in terms of staying current. We buy kit. We expect it to have a life cycle. We expect to go to finance and say, we have written this kit down. The rescheduled renewal interval has come up, and I expect to buy a new kit. And that finance, in turn, expect me to say, well, that's fine. We've been taking a depreciation charge of 10 grand a month or whatever it works out at. Um, and therefore, 10 grand a month over the next three years is another 360,000. Go spend 360,000. And when I say, actually, I need 500,000 this time, again, it upsets them. And finance people bear grudges. Um, and that's bad when you try and spend a lot of money, which is what IT people do. It was self-managed, and again, this will be familiar to a lot of you, especially those in working in smaller companies. We have a 10 by 5 IT department. They, they come in in the morning, they go home in an evening, and they work five days a week, and everyone's on call for the rest of the time. But there's a limit to how many times you can call someone before that becomes fundamentally quite ridiculous. But we have a 24-7 customer expectation, and in fact, we have 24-7 internal staff. Our Chennai, system, uh, our Chennai team and our Bangalore team work round the clock in shifts. So, Again, we had this challenge of do we hire people to sit around? And you know, this is a recruitment company, so everyone here is aware of roughly what sysadmins cost. Do I hire a sysadmin to sit in the building, bored out of their mind overnight, costing me quite a lot of money just on the off chance that goes something goes wrong? And the answer to that really is no. I've got better places I can spend my money than on effectively contingency stuff. Yes, you can use the people working night shifts to do other things and to deliver other things and to fix problems and to address issues and so on. But actually, there is a limit to how much you can do that with people who aren't in the office around the, world, around the workplace. And it's very hard to, to derive as much value out of a person or a couple of people on a night shift as you do out of those same people internally. It's different if you've got big shift patterns. If you've got 40 people working nights and 40 people working days, then you've effectively got an entire company working the night. But if you're only looking at a couple of people, it's hard to interact with them. So we looked at this, and again, we sat down and we did a bit of maths, and we said, well, you know, there's, there's advantages to this. It's capexed, and the great thing about capex is that our parent company has a balance sheet which is in the billions, and so they don't really notice when I go out and spend a bunch of money on capex. Um, they do notice when I spend it on opex because our profit number goes down. Um, 
the great thing about being a non bombier based in Panama is that we don't pay any corporation tax either. So, yeah, it all, all swings in roundabouts. Um, actually, we're, we're based in Holland, but it's not that far off. Um, we um, turn the camera, turn the cameras on. Um, we, uh, I feel like David Cameron stood up here. We have never benefited from, or at least not in the future. Um, so th these were the sorts of challenges that we faced. And again, they're not unusual. They're going to be very similar challenges to most of the people in the room who've worked in small enterprises right through to big teams within the NHS. Yes, there's an enormous amount. And I'm only picking on the NHS because I can see your badge. <laughs> you know, the NHS has an enormous amount of, of IT budget, but it still fundamentally has to funnel down into lots of individual delivery units and hospitals and central service units and so on and so forth. And so all of those people have exactly the same challenges albeit perhaps on a slightly different scale centrally, but when you're actually in the, the thick of it delivering, it's, it's just as difficult. So again, we looked at the cloud, we went and spoke to Microsoft and said, these are some of the challenges that we're facing. Some of the other challenges that we're facing is cloud pricing itself is by its very nature based on how much you use. I don't know how much I'm gonna use, so how do I budget for that? How do I cost for the fact that actually if I start putting all this stuff into the cloud, it's great for the first three months and then I'm bankrupt on the fourth because we suddenly just use a load of stuff. And we were pretty early adopters of a lot of this stuff. It's got better, there are cost prediction tools, there are certainly ways now that you can cost things out a lot easier. But it was pretty terrifying up front. Um, and they worked pretty closely with us to help replace some of the stuff. Now, everything's in the cloud, where did it go? I was very pleased with finding this GIF. Um, again, turns out animated GIF search on Google, turn on safe search if you don't know it works. Um, or don't, but do it at home. <laughs> or use someone else's machine. Um, so yeah, the, the biggest advantage to putting it into the cloud now is that the actual running of it, it's all gone very bright, hasn't it? The actual running of the stuff that we've got up in the cloud now is really no longer my problem. I've, we've put it up into the cloud. Microsoft run a 24-7 operation center. Again, full disclosure, some of that operation center is a bit more American-based than it perhaps might be. And while they might be 24-7, some of those people appear to be in bed for some of that 24-7. So what actually happens is you get a slightly sleepy sounding person with a Texas accent. But they are there and it's fundamentally somebody else's problem. They spend a lot of money on disk. They spend a lot of money on network. They spend a lot of money on compute. They have a lot more leverage over HP and Compaq and do they even still exist? Uh, over HP and Dell and so on than I do. They, they've got commodity sized hardware running on commodity grade hardware, which they can effectively put in, throw away and replace with none of the same challenges I've got around buying stuff and putting it into a server room. I don't know how many of you have seen kind of modern cloud data centers and seen what goes into them. Actually, I was quite surprised when I saw it for the first time. There's nothing there with redundant power supplies, nothing's got redundant NICs, nothing's got redundant memory, redundant CPUs. It is literally cheap consumer grade hardware because it's completely disposable. And the idea is that their cloud fabric will handle failover. So there's no issues around, oh, actually, no, this has failed and I need to order a spare. They literally just take it out, throw it away, put another one in. The inevitable question that whenever we talk about this that we get asked is, oh, so, you know, this is really all about cutting costs. It's about making redundancies in your IT team. It's about outsourcing and that means loss of jobs and so on. And actually, it's not that driver for us at all. Um, we already were a relatively small IT team we're still the same relatively small IT team. We've actually got more people in IT post cloud migration than we did before, and my net budget is the same because we've managed to make savings in terms of kit and CapEx provision, which we've used to bring more people in. The really big difference around it is that we've managed to take the IT team, and Keith's gonna talk more about dev stuff as we go through this in terms of the dev delivery. But we've managed to take the IT team and turn them into much more of a service delivery proactive part of the business. Um, when I took over as a CIO, the main rationale for for me making the pitch that there should be a CIO and then making the very selfish pitch that I should be it, um, was that we had an IT team which was basically following the business around and doing a pretty poor job, if I'm honest, of delivering what the business needed in order to get it where it needed to be. And primarily that's because the, if you treat people like they're a kind of follower and hand them everything off, by the very definition, they're late. So we've managed to turn that into a much more proactive, kind of forward-looking um, team. This bit's kind of secret. Um, so uh, the numbers are fairly well anonymized, but I just wanted to give you something in terms of, of straight comparisons. Um, you really can't see that at all, but that is George Clooney. <laughs> I, I kid you not, then and now. Um, oh, there we go. You put George up and the lights dim. <laughs> um, 
we were running, again, so the stuff that we've just replaced was obviously when we replaced it three years old. Um, and we replaced it a couple of years ago, so, uh, or a year or so ago. So the, the stuff wasn't new when we did it. Um, but we had kit which was about 96 cores across some physical hosts. There was 256 gig of RAM in there, and we were running about 40 VMs on that kit. So you can do the maths for yourself. 40 VMs into 96 cores means we're probably over committing on cores. 40 VMs into 256 gig of RAM means that there ain't a great deal of RAM to go around, and that was still costing us quite a lot of hundreds of thousands of pounds over a, you know, the space of a few years. We've moved that up into the cloud. Most of our instances now are kind of four core 56 gig, but we've got a whole bunch of stuff that's running up there on eight core 112 gig of RAM instances. Um, our web instances, and Keith's gonna talk about our application hosting platform in the next one, assuming I haven't terrified you all or bored you to sleep. Um, so they're totally separate, they don't even count in this VM infrastructure anymore. We've been able to completely take away our customer hosting from our internal productive systems and say, actually, why should they be together? Let's put them separate, let's scale them based on customer demand. We're currently using, for about 25% less than we were when we were hosting it ourselves, we're using around 200 cores and four terabytes of RAM, which you know, when you think, again, it's a fairly significant, more than doubling of cores. Four terabytes of RAM would have been expensive five years ago. It's still quite a lot now. Um, and these are just random, you know, normal VMs running, um, running along as they go. Again, Keith will go into a little bit more of this um, as he's talking about the app platform itself. Um, but the biggest benefit that we've had from moving our apps up into the cloud is that we've been able to take advantage of the auto scaling and uh, geographic distribution that's built into the cloud platform. Um, this is a load test. Um, it's Loader IO for those of you that, that use load testing platforms and think you recognize it, you probably do. Uh, simulating 397,500 logins over a 10 minute period. So it's, it's quite a lot of load for a 10 minute period. The net average time for those requests was a little under nine seconds, which if I'm honest, still isn't really good enough. But the, the really cool thing about this is this started out running on two instances with four gig of RAM each and one core running the web front end. And I haven't put all the graphs up because actually it's quite boring. But what happens when you hit two instances with not very much RAM and not very much core with 397,500 logins in a 10 minute period is they basically die. Um, and those of you that have run web apps in the past will recognize that kind of feeling of impending death where everything just goes very slow and you try and remote onto the box to see what's going on and that doesn't really work. So you fire up a WMI session and that doesn't really work either. And really nothing much works. The great thing about this is that we actually didn't have to touch this at all. We'd just configured a maximum of 10 instances. We'd configured a slightly larger instance size as a maximum. So when we started hitting it and the load time spiked, and that's what this represents, it recognized that our load time had exceeded five seconds, and so it added some more instances for us. The load time then continued up, and because of the very short time frames involved, it actually would, had we spread this over a longer period, have auto-scaled again and again and again until it tried to make the response times fairly flat. Um, but actually, these spikes are the bits that immediately precede a scaling operation. So by the time we got to 10 minutes in, I've got 10 servers running, hosting those same front-end requests. I haven't had to touch it. The extra cost of running those 10, second, or 10 instances, because we're paying effectively by the second for compute, worked out at about £1.40. Um, so when you compare that to the cost of CapEx in kit to go out and service this kind of request level um, as an, at the outset, it's a fairly phenomenal shift in the way that we're able to respond to customer load. I put some of our customers' logos and names and things up at the start of the, the session. It's pretty obvious from the fact that we work with retailers that retailers are in a seasonal business. If you're selling stuff for Christmas or you're selling stuff for Easter and so on, there are spikes that happen naturally throughout the year. Obviously, they start selling Christmas stuff in about April. So, um, and actually, well, joking aside, for us, Christmas does end in around September because you need time to actually get the stuff packed and produced and shipped to stores and so on. So we're like the most miserable, unfestive bunch of kids you'll ever meet. Um, their seasonality is difficult for us as a traditional app service provider because actually for us to cater for a hosting environment that will deal with the fact that all of our retail customers have roughly the same spike means that I have to put kit in there that will deal with the fact that Sainsbury's have Christmas about the same time as Morrison's have Christmas, which is the same time as Asda have Christmas, which is the same time as Walmart, which is the same time as all of the other supermarkets. And that's actually a massive issue for us because suddenly they get really busy. They all go out and they start talking to suppliers about making Christmas puddings and Christmas cakes and buying turkeys and that kind of stuff. 
But then two weeks later, it's all really quiet again because once you've gone out and tended for somebody to produce your Christmas puddings and Christmas cakes and turkeys and so on, someone's actually got to go off and come up with a recipe for a Christmas cake or a Christmas pudding. And then they've got to get it tested to tell you what allergens are in it and how many calories are in it and so on. <coughs> Was it something I said? Um, <laughs> it's the Christmas pudding. It always gets people. Um, so it actually goes really quiet a couple of weeks after launch. So from us, from a scaling perspective, what we used to do was say to customers, oh, do you know what, actually, you're really busy. It will just be slower this time. And obviously, customers love that because right in the middle of their really busy period, you're telling them that the system is really slow and there's not really very much you can do about it. And really sorry, but it's your fault being busy. Um, moving to a cloud auto scaling environment has meant that we're actually able to scale literally in minutes to deal with those spikes and then scale back down again literally in minutes. So I'm not paying anymore for compute that sits idle in that two week period where nobody's doing anything. I don't have to worry about the stuff working. I don't have to worry about it being maintained. I don't have to worry about it updating itself or anything else. That's all managed for me. And it, to be fair, this is, again, it's Azure. We worked pretty closely with Microsoft. Commercially, moving to Amazon was an issue for us because Walmart and Asda are one of our customers and they see or well, certainly Walmart sees Amazon as their biggest competitor in the state. So putting Walmart data into Amazon was challenging from a legal point of view. Um, so we, we kind of were rooted down the Azure or Google route at the outset. Um, and apologies if there's any Google people in the room, but the Google Cloud Compute platform kind of sucks, actually. For a company that's really big and invests a lot of money and uses the cloud extensively, the, the cloud platform just isn't really up to much. AWS would have been a really easy choice. Azure was a really easy choice. We're a Microsoft house. We get a lot of support from Microsoft, so that's, that's why we went that way. But if you're using EC2 and so on, you know, we've, we've done similar tests when we were looking at procuring it, and the same advantages exist in both. There are some challenges around developing for it. You need to make sure that your apps are completely stateless, and that's something that bit us fairly early. If you've got developers who are used to writing code for single instance machines, they say their code is stateless, but they lie, because that's what developers do. Is it stateless? Yes. What is this cookie? Oh. Um, where are you storing state? Oh, it's in a shared process. Shared with what? Oh. All the other users on that same server. Right, yeah. So there were some learning curves that some of the devs had to go through. And again, Keith's going to talk a little bit more about some of those. Um, and certainly, if you don't take those learning curves on board, what you really end up with is basically a VM infrastructure running in the cloud that offers you none of the benefits of all, all the auto scaling, but occasionally moves itself just to confuse you. Um, and it does <laughs> confuse you. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of the auto scaling part. Um, how am I doing on time? That's bread and butter for us. That's the stuff that pays the bills, it's the stuff that we sell to clients, it's the stuff that we charge money for, and it's the stuff that helps our clients realize some significant savings in terms of what they do. But, as I mentioned at the start, part of my remit is also innovation, and it's taking things to clients and saying, actually, we can do this for you, and this is going to be cool, and it's going to help you in, in a couple of different ways. Some of that, and I've got no idea how this video thing is going to work. They're all, oh, check that out. Some of that is non-IT stuff. So I mentioned earlier that we have a pack science division who do physical packaging, and that we're part of a company called Sun Chemical who do inks. This, and I'm kind of a beer and a half in, so I'm going to try and say this slowly, this is electrophotoluminescent ink, which is printed onto Ballantine's whiskey. Um, if you fly, you walk through Heathrow, and what used to be duty-free is no longer called duty-free. It's now called Global Travel Retail. And the reason it's called Global Travel Retail is because duty-free sounds cheap. And who wants to sell cheap stuff, right? If you can sell global travel retail, then you get Russian oligarchs coming into your shop and they will buy a thousand pound bottle of whiskey. Not so much in the EasyJet terminal at Malaga. So global travel retail is a huge market for premium brands. Um, I mentioned earlier that Bacardi are one of our clients. We do some work with most of the, the big brands. Ballantine's approach is said, we want something that will really make our product stand out in the global travel retail environment. You walk through the airport, there's this big taste of whiskey shop, there's usually a nice young lady or a nice young gentleman saying, would you like to try some? And you do, and you don't buy anything, and you leave. Um, you kind of do a circuit and come back and get more free booze. Um, they wanted something that would really stand out. And we went, Why, what can we do that would make it stand out? And so a few ideas were kicked around. One of them was printed circuitry, one of them was electronics on the bottles. But they wanted something that when the customer picks the bottle up and takes it away, doesn't feel rubbish. Because actually most printed circuitry, you've got driver units, you've got batteries, you've got 
you know, circuitry physically embedded in the bottle. There's RFID chips in the back. And it doesn't feel premium when you, you take that bottle off the shelf. So this, there is actually no, there's no battery. There is no RFID chips. There's nothing printed onto this bottle except the actual ink that you can see. But some of the ink responds to electrical current. There's then a driver unit which is plugged into the shelf underneath with a microphone in it. And that microphone picks up the ambient noise in the airport and plays you basically a graphic equalizer across the bottles. The really clever part about that is that they've printed antennas in there so that they can do very close near field communication in them. And again, this is you know, a couple of years by the, in development. So NFC was pretty, in its, pretty new and in its infancy at the time. If you take one of the bottles away from the shelf, the others will make up the gap. So they actually talk to each other as well as picking up the sound. And you pick the bottle up and there is nothing on it except the label, which feels like a normal paper label. And you put it back and it rejoins the equalizer array. Um, cost them a fortune. No extra sales as far as I'm aware, but <laughs> lots of PR out of it. So it kind of paid for itself in the long run. So some of what we do is kind of clever non-code, non-IT stuff. Some of it, ah, see this happened to me the other day. Some of it, I apologize, I have to press the button rather than click the thing. Some of it is a bit of both. So this is an augmented reality app that we did. That chocolate box carton, it's a real chocolate box carton. It's cardboard, it's printed with ink, which to a normal human eye looks just like normal human, you know, eye readable ink. But there is also an ultraviolet ink printed into that, which is recognizable by the augmented reality product to clear up the fact that otherwise you end up printing QR codes and things onto product. And if you're a leading retailer or a leading brand, you don't really want big, ugly QR codes stuck in the middle of your product. It's all right if you're Aldi a little and you want to scan it quickly at a checkout. But if you're going for that premium look, barcodes on all four sides don't work. So that, which I just talked right through. Um, check it out. Plays again, doesn't move slides very well. Um, the augmented reality is actually picking up the contrast on this. There's an image recognition piece of technology built into the augmented reality app. It runs on iOS and Android and so on and is downloadable from the App Store. Um, albeit you then need to probably drop us an email and get you to send, send you some of the demo assets. But it means you can basically have people walking around your store looking at things inside your product. Um, we have a game that goes with this, so you can basically then hold the iPad up and tilt the box, and it will roll a ball down into a hole that's inside the thing, even though there's just no ball and no hole. It's quite clever, and the kids like it. Um, I think some of the interesting stuff around this is there isn't really a market for this yet. Nobody goes into a shop and says, you know what, I'm going to buy that because I can point my phone at it and it will do something cool. But we're moving towards a point where people are increasingly using mobile phones around shops, where there's positional data. Um, there's a company in the States called Arva Retail are doing some really cool stuff with connect sensors, where they stick them above shelves and point them downward. And they can tell that you've picked something up, looked at it, and put it back, um, which is groundbreaking for retailers, because they can tell what you bought, but they can't tell what you didn't buy. Or well, obviously, they can tell what you didn't buy, because you didn't buy it. But, um, what they can't tell is what you picked up and then chose not to buy. So if you pick up a Mr. Muscle, for example, and then you pick up the own brand and you do this, and then put one back, that's actually a really interesting piece of data for a retailer or a brand. Your product is attracting buyers. It's making them pick it up off the shelf, but they're not transacting with it. Is that a price point thing? Is that an ingredients thing? Is that a value reputation thing? Um, and they're doing some really cool stuff around that. It also means that they can potentially send someone to put the stuff back that you've just put in the wrong place. <laughs> How cool is that from a, research, from a supermarket point of view? So there's a, an increasing um, amount of technology going into the kind of shopper experience in a store. And it's pretty likely that over the next couple of years, you're going to get to a point where you can literally walk around a store and hold your phone up and it will tell you what's in things. It will tell you if you've got allergies, which products you can and can't buy. It will tell you if you've got specific restricted diets, kosher, halal, vegan, which products are acceptable for you. The, um, the brands... Um, want to do a lot of stuff around Heinz, for example. Heinz want you to buy their beans, not supermarket beans. The supermarkets want you to buy supermarket beans, preferably over Heinz beans. But if you're going to buy Heinz beans, they want you to buy them there, not at a competing supermarket. So there's a kind of split driver for a supermarket. But as a brand's point of view, somebody like Heinz is really interested in you being able to walk up to a store, point your phone at a tin of beans that sat on the shelf, and see that tin, tin of beans give you recipe suggestions, tell you that two shelves down is something that goes really well with these beans. Why not buy some barbecue sauce or some cheese or baked potatoes or whatever it is you like with your beans? So there's quite a bit of crossover there in terms of what our marketing teams, our pack science teams, and our tech teams are doing. Um, some of it is all geek. So um, I actually find this quite creepy. Um, 
It's like a baby with a brain. Um, a couple of little stats, just I mentioned earlier on, about 80% of the UK shopping trolley contents goes through us. So we have a tremendous amount of access to data. We have probably have more access to most data than most of the supermarkets do, because if you're Asda, you've got access to Asda data. You don't really have a lot, you shouldn't really have a lot of access to Tesco's data. If you're Aldi, for example, you'd love to know what Lidl are doing, but we have a pretty good idea of what they're all doing, because we work for, for most of them at some point or another. We have around 3,000 products that are in development, live and actively being worked on at any given time across those various supermarkets and brands. So that's a lot of launch stuff that's moving through that 48 to 50 week cycle for typical foods and products, up to three years potentially for medicines and vitamins. Um, average, 48 weeks lead time. So you think you're aiming for Christmas, so that's in like week 50. Um, really, you need to be absolutely the latest if it's a fresh product. If it's not in the store by week 50, it's too late. It's not going to be out there for Christmas. You've really got to start that in week two, which means just after everyone's getting back from Christmas, you're saying to them, okay, go out and plan Christmas. Um, and that, there's a lot of logistics and planning and project management that goes into delivering product at such a long lead time that involves such a large number of suppliers and companies and so on. The average cost per product to launch is about 90 grand per product. Um, that's a lot of money when you think about the number of products that a supermarket will launch or a brand will launch. That's across brands and retailers and so on. Um, and again, obviously some of the brands spend a lot of money launching really premium stuff. Some of the retailers spend very little money launching very cheap stuff. Um, if you look at some of the discount supermarkets, Pound Stretcher and Poundland, for example, they spend almost nothing if they can avoid it, but when they do, it tends to be relatively small expenditure on things like shelf-ready packaging. So it's a big cardboard box with a tear-off front, and the box is printed with enough marketing that it's obvious what goes in it, but to stack the shelves, you pick up one box and tear a piece of cardboard, rather than doing this, which is relatively expensive in human terms. You can do the maths for yourself, 90 grand a product, roughly 3,000 products in active development, 48 weeks to get that product delivered, um, and if it goes wrong, you've just lost your 90 grand. Because in retail, launch dates matter. If you launch your Christmas product on Boxing Day, you're knackered. If you launch your Easter eggs just after Easter, they're going in the bin. Or they're going to a discounter and they're going to be sold very cheaply, probably abroad, um, because you don't want to saturate your own home market with your knockoff, well not knockoff stuff, but your stuff that's legit but now massively discounted because you missed the launch date for it. It's expensive to miss launch dates. And we have all this data, we have all this cool information about who's involved in packaging launch and when they're involved in packaging launch and who's doing things on time and who's not doing things on time. And some of that's really easy to map. If you are a supermarket, and let's say you're a supermarket with a big green logo based not very far from here, you'll have a big product management team who are responsible for looking at their product launch. And they will know as a category buyer or you'll know as a category manager that when I buy British beef from Bob's Farm in Clackudders Facts, that you can tell I'm local, um, that when I buy British beef from Bob, that Bob is normally on time. What you don't see is that Bob is my, maybe normally on time for you, but he's actually late for every other supermarket that's buying meat from him at the same time, every time you place an order. All you see is that he's on time. You can't see that he's running at capacity, that he's actually under-delivering on other orders every time you place one, so you're probably getting premium placing in terms of his customer relationships, but he probably doesn't have any more to give. If you suddenly doubled your order size, there's a pretty good chance it's not going to arrive on time, even though he might still put you as his favourite customer. And we've got access to a lot of that. So we've built some, and that really doesn't show up very well in the sun, I apologise for that. Um, we've built some pretty simple machine learning algorithms. Um, this, again, it's Azure, I make no apologies for that. It's a clean, easy to use as, um, machine learning environment. If any of you are interested in machine learning and haven't had a play with it, there's some really good tutorials. It's free. Um, you can sign up for it and use it and just have a play around. And actually, at least to get something working, to build a predictor or a recommender, for example, algorithm, you literally two hours on a weekend or a Friday night with a bottle of wine, and you'll have a reasonable hangover and recommender. Um, this is a two-class neural network. The two-class neural network is the bit here. Um, that's the bit that does the clever stuff. And there's a whole bunch of parameters you can set. But again, the nice thing about the Azure stuff is it will just work out of the box. You don't really have to worry too much about setting parameters. It may not be very efficient out of the box, and it may not be as efficient as it could be. And you might find that your algorithms need training and so on and so forth. But you'll still get some results. And there's some free data sets you can play with. We built some data, or we built based off 
a couple of sets of data. Um, this one was about late SKUs delivered in 2015. So SKUs where the original target date was not met. <coughs> Even if the target date was subsequently changed, we can still tell that, for example, you had to move the date. So yes, it's nice to know that we delivered it on our revised timings, but again, as any of you who've got budgets know, delivering something on a revised agreed date is not quite the same as delivering it on the originally agreed date, and it's a little bit more embarrassing. Um, this is all based on data that was available before the project started. So this is on day one of that 48-week cycle. We can tell you with about 75% accuracy in version one, we've got it a bit better now, we're up to about 96, 97. Um, we can tell you whether your project's gonna launch on time or not. We can give you a confidence factor over that, and we can give you a model that will suggest changes that you can make which increase either the likelihood of on-time delivery or make it on time when it wasn't, or ideally both. If you've got a project which is likely to launch on time but it's only 51% likely, 50-50 being it literally could go either way, if it's 51% in favor of it delivering on time and you can change that to 95% chance of it delivering on time, then you can reduce the number of lakes quite massively. And when you're looking at enormous volumes of projects and money that fundamentally goes to waste when these don't work, some of this stuff is actually pretty cool. Um, and as a bit of a geek, the actual, a bit of a geek, um, the actual maths that's involved in this, yes, you know, if you want to do a, you know, master's and postdoc studies and or doctoral studies in neural networks, you can, and there's a tremendous amount of work that goes into neural networks and learning and training. But actually, it's pretty simple to get started. I would thoroughly encourage you to go and have a play. Um, you can clean the data, basically just remove any rows where there, there aren't all the values, split the data in two. One of those is used to look for the relevant parameters, and again, just out of the box, it will make semi-intelligent guesses. There we go, it's much better. Um, semi-intelligent guesses as to which parameters are relevant because you might have five, 600 features related to a project. You might have five, 600 features related to a clinical study, for example. Some of those may have a really big determining output on the, the result, some of them pretty small. So the sweep parameters methods will make an educated guess as to which ones are likely to generate the, the biggest results. That then scores a model, evaluates a model, and you produce a web service. And that web service is then publishable direct from the studio site, and you can hit that web service just the same as you would any other kind of, it's all JSON restful stuff. Um, it's also available via SOAP and so on for the masochists in the room. Um, but you can hit that with just a restful input and say, here is some data, give me a result and a score and a probability. Um, we conservatively reckon that we would probably save the retail industry three million quid. Um, in the first three months of our trial of this, and we reckon we could probably get that quite a bit bigger now. So it's, you know, it's big enough money that it makes a meaningful difference. Yes, if you're a Walmart, three million quid isn't really a massive top-line contribution, but bottom-line savings of three million quid of not wasted money, big deal. We've also done some image recognition. So you're going to see Keith stand up in a, early, in a, shortly. Keith is, in fact, 44, so it's not a particularly bad guess for him. I am actually only 22. Um, so the image recognition stuff is, is relatively interesting. And again, it's all based around machine learning and, and algorithms around recognizing faces. Uh, this, I presume it's still up, howold.net was a, a Microsoft engineer who put this up for fun. It uses a photo DNA facial recognition service to try and identify the person, gender characteristics. It does make a guess at whether you're male or female, so I can live with the date being wrong or the years being wrong, but at least apparently I look like a bloke. Um, and yeah, it makes an educated guess at your age and so on. People say yes or no, and it retrains itself based on the inputs. Quite clever, quite a fun little project, fairly trivial, fairly meaningless, no real commercial application to us. However, our application platform allows you to upload images and share those images with people around the world. That by its very nature is how product, de product development happens. You will come up with a new Corona label or a new Budweiser label or whatever else, and you will take that image, stick it on a server, and allow potentially thousands of people who are authenticated and secured to get in and see those images and share those images and do whatever they want with those images in the process of launching your product. However, there is an obvious downside to running a platform where we don't know what images people are uploading, where we can't see the images ourselves without a considerable amount of concerted effort, where no one else can see the images unless you trust them to see those images and where you're able to share them fairly anonymously with other users. Um, some of the images floating around on the internet aren't very nice. Um, so 
the photo DNA service that was developed originally as this toy project by a Microsoft engineer has now evolved into a commercially available service. I say commercially, it's free, but you have to sign up and apply and they have to decide that you are in fact a decent, nice person and therefore not going to abuse the service. You upload the image, they hash it, they don't keep a copy of the image, so there's no kind of copyright images, but they hash that image and they compare that against known illegal images. They can distinguish and flag harmful images out of it. But the really cool thing is it uses image recognition to recognize images which have been manipulated, altered, changed, and is able to recognize that the image you've uploaded, or the image that somebody has uploaded, is similar enough to one which was known to be illegal that it's maybe worth looking at because although it's not quite the same image, it's a much better recognition than, I don't know if anybody saw the news today about um, Instagram have been hauled up and, I say hauled up, lambasted in the press again. Um, they suspended somebody's account for posting a picture of a breast and it was in fact a cake with a Malteser on the top. <laughs> um, those kind of wide scale you know, flesh tone matching algorithms. Well, they don't work very well when you're doing product technology, for example, where you've got lots of pictures of people. If you're selling bandages, by definition, there is going to be a person who is mostly naked with a bandage wrapped around their elbow. So flesh discovery algorithms didn't work very well. AOL years ago did word matching algorithms and they banned anything that involved the word breast, which really upset Breast Cancer UK, who found their own website closed down, which they were paying AOL to host at the same time. Big sweeping things like that don't work in the volume of data that we've got anymore. We started talking about big-ish data. We have literally hundreds of thousands of assets which are going through around those 3,000 projects which are undergoing at any given day. There will be around 10 to 15 assets per asset. So you're looking at 10 to 15,000 images per day that we're hosting that are being looked at and commented and approved. It's not possible for us to do any kind of filtering around that. And it simply wouldn't have been possible for us to do any kind of checking around them um, until technologies like this came along. So we're now able to use this, we send the images up, we get a yes, it's clean, or a no, it's not, and if it's not, then um, the, the National Child something or other else Exploitation Centre uh, can take a look and say, yeah, this is not right, um, and then somebody gets a knock on the door. This was one of ours. I said earlier on that the, um, the buttermilk was not, and I was quite pleased the buttermilk was not. This is an Aldi product. It made it to shelf. Um, the font that was used was just a random font, which just randomly capitalizes certain letters. Um, the art workers that did this were in our Chennai office. Uh, it turns out that that doesn't really spring out to somebody who's not a native English speaker as being an inappropriate thing to put on a packet of biscuits. Um, yeah, this one was ours. Um, and it, it made the news. Um, there was another one which I, I actually couldn't find an image of. Um, but imagine, if you will, a salt and black pepper flavor variety of the same biscuits um, and somebody had drawn a pepper grinder, which kind of looked a bit like this. <laughs> which was like a hand around a pepper grinder with a little sort of thing falling off the top, which was black pepper coming out of the top, bizarrely, <laughs> of a pepper grinder. <coughs> Why they drew pepper coming out the top of the pepper grinder, I don't know. But it was just a line drawing of a black pepper grinder sort of sprinkling over the, um, over the biscuits. That one also... Uh, came through in the same round. That one got recognised by a person who looked at it and said, you're having a laugh, somebody's drawn a giant cock on my biscuits. <laughs> um, we're not releasing that. Um, this one didn't, because all the people that were involved in doing this were based overseas and were not native English speakers. And yes, it's fairly obvious to us that that's probably not great product placement. But you spot things which are in your native language, which jump out at you, things like capitalisation, which... A spell checker is not going to pick that up. This is a font. It's not capital U, capital N. This is just a U in the font. So there's no odd capitalization in the underlying text for a spell checker to pick up. The people doing the approvals looked at that and said, is country spelt correctly? Yes. Yes, it is. So that's fine by me. Um, however, we were curious. Um, we ran this through some OCR stuff. It picks it up. It merrily points out that it's country, and it conveniently collect, corrected the spelling so that it was no longer rude, which means the OCR didn't pick it up either. But we ran it through some image recognition software, and it did pick up that there was an offensive term in there. So actually, image recognition software probably could have prevented us sticking this on the shelf in Aldi. Um, luckily, the buyer at Aldi for this particular product had a sense of humor and said, you know, they got quite a lot of press coverage out of this and said it's basically cheaper than advertising, maybe you could just not do it again for a while. <laughs> um, um, sometimes they're quite good. The buttermilk guy, very much less amused. Um, so that was, yeah, that, that was one of ours. Um, image recognition, as I say, fairly sensible 
um, application in terms of product development, some really sensible applications in terms of um, kind of images and child protection and so on and so forth, um, and a much more sophisticated way of doing that uh, than, than the previous mechanisms that were out there. Um, and also, from our point of view, we talk a lot about packaging. So packaging is, by its very nature, and going back to that buttermilk carton again, on a 2D proof, which is how everybody works, if you, any of you that work in the packaging industry to any extent, everything's 2D. You look at pieces of paper that will fold up into a box. It's a 2D print that gets folded, it gets glued, it gets cut. Nobody really sees that and works on it in 3D. But you don't buy anything in 2D, except maybe paper. Um, you don't go into a shop and pick up a 2D product. You don't see what the 2D proofs look like on the shelf. They don't look anything like, really, what they looked like before. Um, I tried very hard to find the video of it, but I couldn't find the video of it. Walmart um, in the States, it never made it to shelf. They had a supplier who did a dog food um, bag. And you know what dog food bags are like. It's like a big, shiny bag made of paper. Big pictures printed on the front of it. Great, wonderful. When you print them, they're flat. And when you're doing all the work on them, they're flat and they're two-sided. Then you fill them with dog food and they're not flat anymore. The bottom of it bulges out and the top kind of folds over. So if your dog food bag consists of a dog sat with its kind of knees bent and front paws between its knees and a dog bowl in the middle, which it's licking, and then the top of the bag folds over, um, what happens is that the press pick up on the bag and they get a pre-press version and they lift the top of the bag up and they go, look, I can make the dog do this. Um, uh, and this is deemed child unfriendly in a country where Donald Trump can get nearly elected. Um, so, you know, some of it's not so great for, for, uh, for press. So there's lots of 3D stuff that goes on. Um, 3D is hard. 3D is much harder than 2D. It's hard to approve. It's hard to look at. It's hard to zoom on. It's hard to render. It's hard to do lights and so on. But also, it's really hard to do physics around 3D objects rapidly. If you're making movies and your dream works, then that's fine because you can basically do all the work in wireframe and then render it later on. But if I said to a packaging designer, yeah, you can do all your work in wireframes and ignore what the picture looks like, they'd think I was mad because basically what they're working on is the picture. They, unless it's the high-res version, they don't care. So there's a couple of technologies that are out. You'll have seen, I'm sure, Oculus Rift, for example, and the Samsung VR. Um, which have been released and, and put into production. Uh, the Samsung VR one is in use in Alton Towers for a 3D roller coaster, of all places. Um, I did ask when I was talking to the Samsung product manager, if you look down, have you got legs? And apparently that was very, very insensitive. Um, <laughs> but the, um, there are lots of headsets out there which are coming out. The HoloLens is the one that we've kind of pinning our colors to the mast of. And the reason that we like the look of the HoloLens is it's powerful, it's got a really good physics engine built in. From a product development point of view, maybe I have to click on this one. If anyone ever figures out videos in PowerPoint. There we go. Um, from a product development point of view, if you're a packaging designer working on, say, a 3D bathroom shower spray, and you can just pinch and extend that shower spray out and make changes to the way that the product looks, and you can render it in real time, that's incredibly powerful. At the moment, that consists of somebody making changes to a wireframe, which somebody else then will do it, make changes to an, images to an image to apply to. We have 3D people and we have 2D people. Um, we'd love to have some 3D, 2D people, but the 3D people tend to be more expensive, so there's a limit to, it sounds awful because they're people, right? But you know, they earn more money because they've got a more specialist skill set. So we tend to have less 3D people and so do our competitors. Um, so what tends to happen is you'll have somebody doing 3D wireframe development and the product and team will say, actually, this is awesome, but you've designed me a product which is narrower at the bottom than the top, and when I put it on a shelf, it falls over all the time. So the 3D guy will go, yeah, okay, I understand that, and he will widen the bottom. He'll then send that to a 2D person, and that 2D person will say, actually, my, my image no longer fits because now the bottom's really wide and my image is not. So they'll change the image, they'll reapply the image, and it goes out and it goes round and round and round and round and round. And it will get to the point of approval again, and then somebody will look at it and say, I would like to change this, and it has to go back through that whole process again. Being able to do that in 3D is a really big deal. And we're reaching a point now where things like HoloLens have actually got the compute capacity on board to work in an acceptable resolution. This is probably good enough for the majority of packaging development. Yes, you need high-res proofs right at the end, but this is good enough. You could work on this and you could produce a piece of packaging. It also works, I don't know why these don't play, um, it also works with physics. And what you're going to see here is this thing bounces off the table. If you're making 
a product which is designed to sit on a shelf in a supermarket, this is Mars, they don't have supermarkets. Um, if you're making a product, I thought I'd trimmed the video earlier in that. If you're making a product to sit on a shelf in a supermarket, whether or not it sits on the shelf is a big deal. If you make something which is pyramid shaped and falls over all the time, it annoys the supermarkets because they spend all their time picking them up off the floor, which means they won't carry the product, which means you won't sell them. If you make a product which doesn't stack easily for shipping, it means you've got more wasted space in shipping, which means more CO2 emissions, which means more charges, which means less environmentally friendly CSR statements, it means more food miles, it means consumers are less likely to buy your product, allegedly, hands up who buys product based on food miles. Um, but you know, it, does, it does make a difference. So the 3D modeling and the ability to attach things to 3D surfaces, to be able to pin stuff to a surface and say, what happens when I put this here, is really powerful. So we're working with Microsoft at the moment on, so far, just the emulator, which is a bit sad, but we've got the HoloLenses on order. Um, they're coming in in June, hopefully a little bit before, but probably June. Um, and we're pretty excited about the fact that we should be able to, in June, be able to take those 3D models that our art workers are doing and with a portable device, walk into an actual supermarket, put a pair of goggles on, which is not going to make us look stupid at all, and see our products, which are still well in development, but on an actual shelf. And you can push things apart, which also annoys the supermarkets. You can push things apart and see your 3D product in it. And you can tap them and see what falls over. Does your product stay on the shelf while everyone else's falls off? Win. Um, and all of this is becoming possible thanks primarily to the fact that there is this enormous set of cloud compute resource which the HoloLens can tap into and so on. To try and do that all on a portable device in the kind of resolutions that we need and with the kind of data sizes that we need is pretty hard. But to have that cloud-hosted cloud compute and stream down images over a 4G link is eminently possible. Uh, the bit that I thought I'd trimmed out of this video, and again, these videos are public domain, you can go and find them. Um, this is NASA working with Microsoft on a HoloLens, and they're actually doing explorations of the Mars surface based on holographic people who will walk around, and this is actually in a warehouse, it's not really in Mars, much like the original Apollo landings. Um, controversial. Um, this is in a warehouse, they're testing at the moment, but their idea is that they can put astronauts or buggies or whatever on a planet, and they can have that buggy respond to a person's actions and movements and so on. So a scientist can bend down and take a look at something and the buggy will pick up the thing that the scientist picks up. But they can have astronauts walking on the moon or on a Mars colony or whatever else it is by the time we get there. And that they can have right next to them a person who is back in Houston and the person in Houston can go, what's that over there? And they can turn and look and see it all together. Um, don't know yet. <laughs> um, and I think there is, that, to be fair, I think is currently the biggest challenge with it. It's not actually the doing this that's the challenge. They've already, yeah, it, it's the physics bit in the middle, which some physics we can replicate and use to our heart's content. The time transmission is a little bit more difficult. Um, but they're already doing this in terms of meeting rooms and hollow presence. And again, it's, it's not really our cup of tea. It's, it's not where we play in the space. But there are companies already working with HoloLens to do hollow presence for meetings. So you can literally walk into a meeting room and stick these things on and you're all stood in a circle and you can talk and shake hands and all the rest of it. There's haptic sensors which are being developed. The University of Bradford actually are doing some work on haptic sensors to enable you to shake hands with a hologram and feel like it's squeezing your hand. Um, which is pretty freaky in some respects, but actually also pretty cool. Um, I'm expecting that they're going to have a simulator where you can dial up as it is, you know, good handshake, crap handshake. Um, hi. Um, <laughs> So yeah, there's a lot of stuff that's happening already around this, which is being extended out. The, the time delay, I don't know how they're going to get around it, to be perfectly honest. I'm not sure. And certainly if they're talking about the same kinds of challenges we are with supermarkets, 4G is fast enough for us to stream enough data up about what they can see through the cameras that are attached to the HoloLenses that you then get the data back and we can process it. We can return to you what the 3D thing would look like on the shelf. And 4G is plenty quick enough for that with the kinds of size of data that you're looking at about terrain data, for example, from the Mars rover, these are not particularly big pictures compared to what we're talking about, but you're talking very low bandwidth connections over enormously high latency. It's a bit like using Virgin Media. Um, well, I can say that because I'm a Virgin Media customer, um, grudgingly. Uh, it's, it's pretty hard to, to work out how they're going to get around that bandwidth challenge and the latency challenge. And as with many things these days, it's latency really rather than bandwidth that's the biggest challenge around it. Um, but it's pretty cool. And frankly, they're doing stuff which is way more complicated than us. We just make product for supermarkets. So that really 
is it from me. Um, I don't know how I'm doing for time. I've got no idea whether I've overrun massively or... <laughs> Told you you were staying late. Um, it literally, when I ran through this at home, it was like 17 minutes. Um, yeah, that's it from me, really. I, it's a cheesy old quote, the geek shall inherit the earth, but I, we do a bit of work with schools and things as well. And the really cool thing now is we're talking about digital. It's no longer a specialism. Technology is no longer something that people do as a career, and it only affects those people. Digital and the technology that underpins it has become core to just about everything we do. You get in a car and there's more computing power in a car than there was in a computer a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, the, the technology that underpins things is just incredible. Uh, Leeds Beckett University are doing a project about wearables and wearable smart clothing so it can tell when you're sweating too hard and it can tell you to slow down via sending you a text, which frankly if you need a text to tell you that you're sweating then. <laughs> but I mean it's cool just from a geeky point of view. Um, we are definitely moving into a place where technology is starting to be the very fabric of what we're doing and the Internet of Things gets a lot of press. But all of that really is driven by the fact that somewhere up in the back end of that is this enormously elastic compute resource, whether it's Amazon's elastic compute or Azure's, which is able to power stuff so that actually we no longer have the, the compute and processor challenges locally. And that's it from me. Have beer. Why, why is your data growing? Because you're dealing with the same number of uh, customers, the same sort of campaigns. Same. No one's thought that the packaging is radically different now to what it was last year. Um, there's a couple of drivers behind that. One is that what used to happen was that you would get, so take food photography, for example. You get a food photographer, and then the first question the food photographer, the first question the food photographer, try saying that five times fast, <laughs> would ask is, what's it for? And you would say, it's a film, film lid tray with a card sleeve. 7x4, and they would take photography at a resolution appropriate for a 7x4 carton, because they were then going to try and send you those images, and originally that would have been an ISDN connection, and they'd upload them, and then it was kind of stick them on a CD, and then it would stick them on a DVD. These days you can't really fit most of it on a DVD, so they'll send us now images which are routinely 3, 4, 5 gig for a big, large format image, which we're expected to scale and use appropriately. They're expecting more multimedia, omni channel -y type stuff, so, for example, we're expected to produce now, uh, you saw the Unilever at the start. Um, for Unilever, we produce lots of 2D stuff, as is traditional, but we're also expected to produce 3D stuff. The 3D stuff is actually really low-resolution imagery because of the fact that it's got to fit to a 3D mesh. But we need the high-resolution imagery so that we can put attachment points on the 2D stuff to fit it to the mesh so that when it wraps, it gets the distortions correct. And distortion is hard work. If you get something which is, for example, um, Fabric softener is a really good example. Fabric softeners tend to come in bottles which are kind of slightly curvy and have a shrink wrap rather than be printed onto the bottle. I think probably all the brands do shrink wrap. If you look at the shrink wrap, even the really premium brands, their own logos will be distorted. You'll see a round logo or the Unilever U and it will kind of squish as it goes through those distortions. And that's because we as an industry, both the brands, the retailers, us as providers of graphic services, still aren't very good at accurately predicting heat shrink distortion onto a firm subject. So what we tend to end up doing is predicting where the distortions will be and overlaying really high res pieces into the distorted area so that when we distort it, we can get that. So we're getting much higher resolution imagery in. We're providing much higher resolution imagery out because what used to happen with print, um, so SBS has been around for 122 years. When it started out, it was people with styluses scratching into wax tablets. Um, and they would then fill those wax tablets with uh, plaster and that would then make a steel mold and then that would make a steel tablet which stamped up and down with ink on it. That's all pretty much, it does still happen and if you look at very high production run stuff, Mars bars for example, they run on a, a just a continuous roll of print. It's, it's worth investing a lot of money to make a metal gravure roller which is a lot of money to make but you're going to print a hundred million Mars bar wrappers a day or whatever number it is that they print. So it's worth investing in that cost. You do something a lot smaller print run, it's probably all going to go digital. And the digital files that go to printers and repro companies, they expect to be higher res because the printers themselves will then amend those files to fit the specifics of their print process. And in theory, we're supposed to do all that for them before it gets there, but in practice, printers generally know their kit better than they can describe their kit. So they'll tell us it's a CMYK process with a dot gain of 0.25 or whatever, and we produce it, and it gets to the printer, and they go, ha, 
it's none of that. And they'll just tweak the files, but they need them at a sufficient resolution by the time they get them to be able to still make those amends and still print them onto pack. So the source files we're getting are bigger, the usage of them is bigger. We're expected to share inputs now with marketing companies, multimedia companies, TV studios. You expect that when you get a film shoot, for example, that the same asset that you get for film shoots will be able to use for internet video, much lower resolution than film. Um, that you'll be able to use the same thing for your packaging development, for your point of sale equipment, um, and standees and all that kind of stuff. And gone are the days when we used to get kind of resolution specific inputs. So we're just getting bigger stuff basically. Um, and when you multiply that by a few thousand assets a day, it doesn't need to be a lot bigger before that starts adding up into a much bigger input. Have you got any sort of offlining on that, you know, that big cloud storage you're talking about? I mean, years ago, you know, it'd be, you had some stuff on hard disk, and if you hadn't touched it for six months, it'd go yeah. onto a DVD that go into a robot jukebox or something, or is it now a case of storage you show cheap, it's just easier just to put it on disk? A little bit of both, if I'm completely honest on that front. We, we do archive. Um, we actually archive off to another one of the cloud stores rather than onto disk, and there's a couple of reasons around that, and it's predominantly really DR and BCP stuff about the fact that if we lost our UK facilities, we'd still want the archive to be accessible in India. Being able to ship off-site tapes, off-site boxes, or the robot jukebox thing is, is obviously quite a lot of shipping. Um, there's the time to restore. So if you think about the time it takes to restore a petabyte of stuff off tape, you know, that's somebody sat in front of a tape loader going eight weeks worth of tape rotations to do your restores. So we do archive, we archive off onto a, an, another cloud store, auto tier. Um, that said, we do that for reasons other than the fact that we necessarily want to keep copies of it offline, if that makes sense. So we have a problem in that, as I said, we have about 500 staff. So that's 500 idiots, really, sat behind a mouse that are able to drag and um, that are able to drag and move things and create and destroy files more or less at will. And that causes us problems because just like anyone else who's got users, sometimes they do stuff and then they put a ticket in and say, I've done this and I didn't really mean to. Why did you do it? I don't know. Um, my favorite of which was a teaspoon went in my USB port. <laughs> How? I don't know. I was eating a yogurt and the teaspoon just went in the USB port. Um, it happens to me all the time. Um, so we, we do archive the stuff and we do move it off to another one, but that's primarily so that we've got kind of, the, the nice thing about Store Simple is it lets us do 15 minutely snapshots. We keep the snapshots for the day, we keep hourly snapshots for a week, we keep the daily snapshots for a month and we keep weekly snapshots forever. Um, and that's a 1.4 petabyte store. So it's, you know, there's, there's a significant amount of storage growth involved in that. But the downside to snapshots is there's still not an easy way of being able to instantly retrieve a copy when you realize you've done something wrong it's still a mount the snapshot, move to it, and we have a lot of Mac users, and it turns out doing that's quite hard on Macs and so on. So actually, it was easier in terms of time and cheaper in terms of cost to just have two of them. So actually, we've got 1.4 petabytes of deduped or deduped and compressed data, which is really 2.8 petabytes, and then we're storing it all twice. So we're really using 2.8 petabytes to store 5.6 petabytes of stuff. But um, but yeah, we do still offline in the sense that we would traditionally have archived off to tape. So what's your traditional operating size in terms of storage? If you've got, I assume a large chunk of that is archiving. Yeah, it's, uh, archive is, again, a little bit interesting around the way archive works in, in retail packaging. So they'll do a lot of redevelopment of work, for example. We'll get something which is, um, I'm trying to think of examples I can give you without landing myself in any kind of confidentiality hot water any more than I already have. Um, you'll get, I don't know, a Corona, for example, and they'll do a 50p off version, and they'll put a flash on the bottle that says 50p off. They don't want to pay for a new artwork to just put a 50p off sticker, so they'll say, that label that we did three years ago, I just want to put a 50p off thing on it, and I'd like it done today because there's nothing to do except a 50p off thing. So our archive to current data is a little unpredictable, and we, again, we have some relatively clever analytics that says which jobs are coming in, which clients are doing what, which projects are they doing, which things did they use last time they did similar projects, and we'll try and pull that down. Um, but we have about, again, because it's deduped and compressed, there's 80 terabytes of cache on-prem, <coughs> which holds about 160 terabytes of raw data, and we would say that 160 terabytes is our working store, and we'll exchange on a daily basis about 16 terabytes up to the cloud and down for stuff that we think is gonna be active tomorrow. But the nice thing about the store simple and the auto tiering is although it is in the cloud, it still presents itself as a single volume. 
So yes, it's annoying if somebody gets a file that we didn't expect them to need and they double click it and it's 22 gig and I have to wait for it to download, but they can double click a file which isn't on the box and it will just download. And as long as there's only one of them doing it or two of them doing it at a time, 22 gig over a gig link isn't horrendous. It's when you've got hundreds of people doing 22 gig over a gig link. Um, so about 160 terabytes on-prem, as I say, about 10% of that probably up and down each day. Yeah, um, we, with one exception, which is Walmart, for obvious reasons, we store those in the States. Um, but with, with, the, with the sole exception of Walmart, everything's in the EU. We store Amsterdam as a primary and Dublin as a secondary. Um, we have had clients ask about storing stuff in Asia. Um, we've had clients ask about storing stuff in China. Uh, we had one pharmaceutical company that said, we'd like to store our stuff in China, but we need to make sure the government can't get at it. <laughs> sure. <laughs> How hard can that be, right? Um, yeah, just ask Apple. Um, so yeah, we, we're, we're subject to most of the same stuff. Safe Harbor for us wasn't such a big deal because most of our stuff was in the EU, in the EU, in the EU anyway. And Microsoft, to the extent that you know Apple have gone to bat against the FBI for data security and privacy and so on, Microsoft are doing the same kinds of thing. Brad Smith, their general counsel, is probably the most vocal part, or most vocal voice in terms of anti-government interference with data that sits offshore. So the US government subpoenaed Microsoft for access to some stuff that was in a data center in Ireland and Microsoft refused and that's still bouncing its way through appeal. Um, but our stuff is in the EU, it's under an EU subsidiary, it's, it's all encrypted at rest anyway, so even if Microsoft were forced to hand it over, they'd hand it over encrypted data and then I'm sure the NSA would look at our encryption and laugh. Um, but you know, it, it's standard AES encryption and so on and, in as much as anyone's got anything that's safe from anyone, our data is encrypted at rest and it's always encrypted back and forth and so on and so forth. Why Amsterdam um, as your primary and Ireland as your secondary? Uh, most of our customers are mainland Europe. So Unilever, for example, headquartered in Rotterdam, uh, L'Oreal, Paris, uh, RB, India and the UK. So the UK is probably better for us but less good for our customers and because we can use the same data store to serve up assets directly to them and they can upload to it, Amsterdam made a bit more sense. That's my official answer. Practically speaking, it's because when I originally set the very first one up as a pilot, I got North and West Europe slightly confused. Um, and then it turns out to be fairly hard to move 1.4 petabytes of data from, from location to location. Um, but practically speaking, it's kind of the same thing and it's all the same region. So when you first started, did you literally sit down at the Azure portal with the company credit card, put the numbers yep. in and start it up? We literally started. Um, so when I, when I took my current job on at SBS, we were buying licensing. I mean, it, it's, it, it's laughable. And you, you look at it and you just think, I don't know how this could be so bad. But actually, most of the places I've ever been in my career have been equally bad for various reasons. So everything does similar stuff. We were buying Adobe Creative Cloud for 250 something art workers and we were buying boxed copies, retail. Um, no, no licensing agreements around that. Um, we had about 150 virtual cores on 96 physical ones running SQL Server. We were buying retail SQL Server. Um, we had a SPLA service provider license agreement which gets you some significant discount. We didn't buy anything under that at all. Um, we had open license agreements and select agreements but we weren't really buying very cleverly under those either. Um, so frankly, I didn't really have anywhere to go but up in terms of a licensing kind of um, process. We literally sat down on day one and said, actually, we've, we've got this idea and Keith's gonna, if, assuming I don't fill the entire evening with waffle, uh, Keith's gonna talk about Sunrise, which is our app platform. And we sat down and we looked at what we had and it was all very VM hosted and SQL on a VM and IIS on a VM and we ran them ourselves. And we said, we, we, there's got to be something better we can do with this infrastructure as a or infrastructure workload. We could put that in the cloud. Why don't we try it with one? So we said, well, let's just buy you know, company credit card, let's buy a couple of VMs. Um, we actually, at the time, had an implementation manager who said, we can do that free trial. You can sign up, you get 30 days. And then he spun up a machine with like 150 cores and burned the entire 30 days allowance of trial stuff in 11 minutes. Um, wasn't really even long enough to log on for the first time. A little depressing. Um, but yeah, we literally stuck a credit card in, took a couple of VMs. Um, and it's pretty much grown from there, really. We, we added a few more, we added a few more. We decided that maybe buying it by a credit card pay as you go wasn't perhaps the best route. Um, credit card run out. <laughs> yeah, actually I'm quite lucky on the credit card not running out because it's a company one, they, they tend to keep going for a while. 
Um, but yeah, we, we added more and more and more. And then Microsoft actually rang us and said, we've noticed that you've done quite a lot of spend on Azure and you're a fairly early adopter and you're using everything. Um, you know, what, what's going on? Do you work for Google? Um, <laughs> I suspect they were probably the only people at the time spending the kind of way we were. Um, and we, we then we've moved to an enterprise agreement and we've got a whole bunch more kind of sophisticated buying mechanisms in place now and we've got a Microsoft account manager who helps us and technical account managers who do premier support and proactive stuff with us and all the stuff you would expect of an enterprise. But it was at the time literally uh, we've got this stuff, we've got a limited amount of resource to go out and do any kind of massive scoping project and we've got to do something to replace what we've got. It's either buy it again and put it back into a colo um, or we go to the cloud and actually if we might as well just try the cloud. So we moved a couple of test sites and it was quicker and it was cheaper. Um, and we didn't really have any problems with them falling over until after we'd moved our production workloads and then we had quite a few. Um, but yeah, it worked. It worked pretty well. It wasn't, it wasn't a particularly onerous project. Have you had problems with the uh, Azure downtime? Uh, past yeah. Um, Depends on the system. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, so there are a couple of best practice guidelines for Azure which we knowingly don't follow. Um, one of those, and, and to be fair, it's not that we choose not to follow them because we think we're somehow cleverer than Microsoft, although you know, we may be. Um, we, we know we don't follow them. So for example, our infrastructure as a service, they recommend that you always have two virtual machines in a load balance fault tolerant set. The reason that we have got applications running on infrastructure as a service virtual machines at all is because we can't load balance them. So having recommendations that you load balance as a set, uh, and the only reason that we've got them running at all is because we can't, is a little bit useless. So we do know that some of what we do is not really what the platform was developed for. Um, I would, again, full disclosure, yeah, we, we've had some issues. I mean, to be fair, they've been pretty proactive about fixing them, but yes, we've had issues with things going down. We had a VM which just persistently rebooted um, about one o'clock in the morning, about three o'clock in the morning, about four o'clock in the morning, and about seven o'clock in the morning which sounds like a really good time for it to reboot until I say those are GMT times and it's the box running a US site. So it pretty much took out their afternoon every day. Um, and it did that pretty much regularly for a fortnight until eventually we managed to get hold of a support engineer who said actually the physical hardware node it's on is knackered. And all of this spiel we give you about it being consumer grade hardware and it's disposable and everything else, and we have an app fabric that moves it from one to the other. We never thought it might move it from one to another broken one and then back. <laughs> so, they had two bad ones, uh, and it literally was failing over from one, moving it to node B. Node B was then faulty, so it would move it back to node A, and it was just flip-flopping between two faulty nodes. Uh, we, we, <laughs> oh, it was doing it routinely. I mean, it, it did it constantly. It was a considerable amount of pain for us getting to the point of, of working out what it was. In Microsoft's defense, they were pretty open and honest about the fact that they'd never really thought about the fact that if they had two nodes that were in different racks, which happened to go bad at the same time. And we just got unlucky with timing, but you know, the, the point we made back to them is it's all right being unlucky, but if we're a thousandth of a percent of their customers, if you've got a million customers, that means one of them's got the problem all of the time. <laughs> you know, a thousandth of a percent is quite a lot if you're that one person. Um, 99.95, yeah. And to be fair, we've, I would say we've had better uptime overall on Azure than we had from a colo data center with kit that ran in there that was fully redundant and all the rest of it. We really haven't had big problems. The problems that we have had are ones where we know that we're not quite doing the right thing or where perhaps we've not maybe read some of the documentation well enough up front. Um, so you attach VHDs to a machine and you create a new VHD and you attach it and it becomes a disk and that's great and wonderful and it says, would you like to format the disk? And you say, yeah, and we have a whole bunch of files so we have an approval system. And it takes a big asset and it chops it up into tiny little chunks. And those tiny little chunks are about 150 to 500 bytes. Tiny, tiny files. Um, when you've got a disk which is a terabyte, the block size on that disk is fairly big. So you've got a lot of wastage on the disk. And we say, well, why don't we just make the block size small? We make the block size a kilobyte. Turns out that absolutely nails the Azure storage infrastructure. There is big, bold lettered things saying do not do this, otherwise your machines will occasionally lose connection to the disk when the storage system can't keep up with a block size of a kilobyte on a large volume. And we did it, and then we had these problems, and then we reported it as a support thing, and they sent us a link to the article that was out long before we made the mistake in the first place and said this is why you've got the problem, move it. So there certainly has been some of that, and I would say my big criticism of a lot of the Microsoft stuff is that there is so much documentation that sometimes finding what you're looking for and finding the right guidance has been probably a harder problem than implementing the guidance that you've got. But again, we're, you know, we're not that big. We started out doing very small steps. 
we started out on perhaps the bleeding edge and making some fairly ambitious steps. And I think it's fair to say that overall that's paid off, but with some pain. As we've got more and more involved in the Azure ecosystem, we've done more and more stuff with Microsoft. They've been a lot more proactive and supporting. And certainly if you're, a, so for example, we, we've never had Premier as a support offering from Microsoft, despite all of this stuff that we did. We didn't have Premier because it was just deemed to be a cost that wasn't worth paying by my predecessor and his predecessor. We've now got Premier, and so as a result, actually, there's a lot more engagement that goes on. And certainly, if you're big enough to, to think about Premier, and there are special offers available right now, um, if you're big enough to think about Premier, the, the sort of technical account manager, product specialist roles, and advisory support that you get from them is, is worth its weight in gold in navigating through that ecosystem. In terms of maturity of Azure, uh, if we were to move our data onto Azure Cloud and do processing on it, yeah. Do you reckon it is uh, mature enough to support the existing uh, Microsoft capabilities? Yeah. We, we've had, let's say, we, we've had problems, yeah. but the problems that we've had have been where we've tried to do something which is way outside of either what it was intended to do or at the time what it was intended to do in public release. The stuff where we've used either core capabilities, where we've used SQL as a service, for example, yes, we've had primary nodes go down, but the failover has worked. We've had storage subsystems where a primary node has become unavailable, but it's just moved itself. And we've seen milliseconds of outages where something has just unmounted itself from Amsterdam and it's suddenly mounted in Dublin and we're like, what's gone on there? And it turns out it was an issue in Amsterdam and it's moved. And actually, all the resilience and redundancy stuff that we've hit has worked where it was supposed to. The bits that we've suffered from have been where we've tried to push the envelope a little bit and then certainly when it was early days, we pushed the envelope quite a bit on the infrastructure as a service, which if I'm completely honest, I don't think they were quite ready to go public, public release with the IaaS stuff when they did. The PaaS stuff has always been great. The IaaS stuff was probably released a little early. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Sorry, you're only like. <laughs> 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 <laughs>